electrolysis machines do roughly minus 200 to minus 500. The red water, which I'll go into more detail on, begins at minus 500 and can go up to minus 900. Now, what's the difference in the red water and the electrolysis water is that things happen faster. Now, why is electrolysis additionally important? Dr. Born Nordstrom out of Sweden said, okay, these guys aren't going to believe any of this stuff. So I'm going to do my research and put it all, a hundred research articles all in one book and let them tear it apart and take a look at it. And what he found was that the body is loaded with electrolysis membranes. Your brain, your lungs, your heart, almost any interface with another organ has an electrolysis membrane in it, just like the electrolysis water machines. And so again, it's replicating nature in terms of what it does. Now, those are characteristics, structure, pH, ORP, or oxidation reduction potential. Now, in my work at Johns Hopkins several years ago, where I had a theory that water might make a difference if I could use it with some of our drug addicts, and I had the opportunity to work with female drug addicts who were either addicted to heroin or cocaine, or to both, or to heroin or cocaine and alcohol. Many of them were pregnant, and most of them had been addicts for at least 10 years. So we're not talking about a casual user. What I found, and again, they helped me prove this hypothesis, and I chose not to leave my work at Hopkins. Once I was able to prove that we were correct, decided it was time to move on. Now what I found was just dealing with this slide. Now for many of you, if you think of the body as a big battery, I mean the brain as a big battery, or a big electrical receiver, and there's some of the odds that say, what are you talking about, I'm electrical? Oh no? What do you do when I put an EKG up to your chest? What do I measure but electricity? What do I measure when I do an EEG? Remember the old Dr. Kildare stuff and flat line? I was measuring electricity as it courses through the heart and through the brain. What do I do when I do an EMG? I'm measuring electricity as it courses through your muscles and nerves. You might get the idea that there may be some electricity in this body. Well, in looking at the so-called addicts, what I found were a couple of things. They usually fell into one of two categories. On the left side there, we saw that salt, caffeine, nicotine, and cocaine all acted the same way. On the other side, sugar, alcohol, tranquilizers, marijuana, and heroin. I said, what are you talking about, Doc? Well, let's see what we got here. On the salt side, we're dealing with individuals who have pain, that are holding on the stuff. It's like pulling elephants out of quicksand. And those things act like the body's natural painkiller, which is tryptophan. On the other side, on the sugar heroin side, they act like two substances that, again, are produced by the brain, specifically serotonin and melatonin. If you don't know how to spell them, here we are. We'll call them Sarah and Mel for these purposes. Now, you know, it sort of bothers me a bit when I <clears throat> see some kids at lunchtime or right after lunch, and I'm sure if there are any teachers in the audience, they usually say, I really hate to teach the kids in the afternoon because they're off the ceiling or on their way to school in the morning with a, a soda and a bag of potato chips or a candy bar and a bag of potato chips. What they're doing is this. They're actually 
overriding on one side and using the other side to counterbalance it. Now, I'm going to zero in on the sugar heroin side to say these things have a tendency to slow the brain down so that they can function. Now, who has fast moving brains? Your babies and your dyslexics or your attention deficit disorder entities. Now, I hate that term because they are our geniuses. And I can say that anybody who has a young baby around, that you know that they have some fast moving brains. If I've got a fast moving brain, I've got to put jet fuel into a jet engine. Now, I used to teach a course called Subliminal Dynamics. And in that course, we began to look at who was really handicapped, who really had the deficit. And I found that the so-called learned entities had the deficit. Because in that course, we started reading at 25,000 words a minute. And to go up as high as 600,000 words a minute. Now, in regular reading, you can only read 250 words a minute. That's as fast as the fastest talker on the earth so far has been programmed to be able to read. 250 words a minute. So you see it, you say it, you read it. Okay, that's the way you teach it. Here comes Jane. There is, you say it out loud, you see it, whatever, okay? That's very slow to a fast-moving brain who wants to begin reading at 25,000 words a minute. Now, in that course, what we did was, the first test in the course is to give the whole group a thesaurus. Now, mixed in that group always, at least in the course that I taught, were so-called dyslexic, and then the learned, supposedly, you know, your accountants, your doctors, your lawyers, your teachers, etc. And invariably, the dyslexics always blew away the course. Because we gave them a thesaurus, and we said, turn the pages of the book as fast as you can, upside down, backwards, just keep going through it until we tell you to stop. And we took the thesaurus away, and in front of them, we placed a blank page and said, we gave them 10 words. We gave the whole group 10 words. And they had to write down what page that word had been on, all 10 of those words had been on, where on the page the word had been, meaning on the left side, right column, you know, up, upper the lower portion. And invariably, the dyslexics each time would get eight out of ten of those correct. And they didn't know the words ahead of time, so there was no cheating ahead to say, I'm going to be looking for where this word is. And the so-called learned often were good if they got one or got anywhere near the page. That's not in all cases, but in general, that's what was going on. So you get the picture that perhaps we have fast-moving brains, and when I do the studies done by the National Educational Association about how children learn, the curve looks like this. From infancy to five years of age, it's constantly going up. And at five years of age, it goes down for the rest of their lives. Now, what happens traditionally in American schools at five? They go to school. 